Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word and I thank you for the time of fellowship we have around the word. Just open up our mind and our heart to see things we've not been able to see before because you illuminate them to us. Teach us, Lord, and guide us and prepare our heart for the day that we're in and all that's coming on the face of the earth to the glory of your name. Amen. So we're picking it up. If you've still got last week's notes, I'm on page nine. Right in the middle of it where it says, oh, that's page nine for me. That's not page nine for you, is it? Yours is different. Page four for you guys, is it? Where I say um, back to Revelation and the great white throne judgment. If your name is not in the book of life, so I'm just going to pick it straight up from where we were last week without an intro, so hopefully you can remember what we were doing. If your name is not in the book of life, you are cast into the lake of fire, the second death. And that's fairly clear, isn't it? It literally just says that. Great white throne judgment, the book is opened. If your name is not in the book of life, you are thrown into the lake of fire. In Matthew 25, verse 41 and 46, then he will also say to those in his left hand, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, this everlasting fire, according to Matthew 25, 41, is made or created or prepared for the devil and his angels, those that rebelled against God. And it's everlasting fire. I would assume that it's everlasting fire because angels are built in such a way that they can't die. They are angelic. They live so that means the angels that were there back at the garden are still the angels that are around today. They don't die. So therefore, this lake of fire was made for them to be cast into, which then makes it everlasting punishment. But because people are thrown into the lake of fire, the ones who don't have their name written in the book of life, that doesn't correlate that that means it's eternal suffering for them or eternal punishment. Verse 46, Matthew 25, 46, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, the reason I can say that that everlasting punishment is, is probably better thought of or translated punishment that will be eternal, not eternal suffering. The punishment here directly relates to the lake of fire. That's what I'm talking about is in Matthew 25, verse 46. Because some people, you might read that and go, well, there you go, there's eternal suffering for believers, sorry, non-believers who are thrown into the lake of fire because it says these will go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into eternal life. And many have translated that and believe that to be they are eternally suffering in the lake of fire while we're enjoying ourselves in heaven. And as I said last week, I don't believe that's the case and I believe there's a problem with that if we can be rejoicing over loved ones who are screaming in agony in the lake of fire for all eternity. And many people reject the God of the Bible on that basis, but I don't think that's actually a good interpretation. The punishment here directly relates to the lake of fire. And as we know from Revelation, the lake of fire is called the second death, the death of a person's soul, because we can match that up with Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell, right? indicating that people's soul is destroyed in hell. And because John calls it the second death, that adds further weight to the lake of fire causing death to human beings. This means there is an eternal nature to the punishment. We now know that the punishment is destruction of the soul, in hell, the second death, making the punishment everlasting or eternal, not eternal suffering. So they're different things. Eter eternal punishment, like the punishment has an eternal consequence. You're going to be thrown into a lake of fire, which is the second death. Your soul will be destroyed. It is eternal. You're not coming back from that. Not eternal suffering. The fires of hell might be eternal because Satan and the fallen angels were created eternal, but we are not. We need to be given the gift of eternal life. So if we don't already have eternal life, then when we're thrown into the lake of fire, 
we're not like angels that have eternal life. We have to be given eternal life because we are mortal. 1 Corinthians 15, 53. For this corruptible must put on in sorry, this corruptible must put on the incorruptible, and this mortal must put on immortality. So we're mortal and we've got to put on immortality. But when this corruptible puts on the incorruptible and this mortal puts on immortality, then will come about the word that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So death for us exists because we are mortal. But death will be swallowed up in victory at the end. So for me, what this shows is anyone's name who's not written in the book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire was made for Satan and the demons, the angels that fell with him. They will most likely suffer eternally there. But any person whose name is not written in the book of life that is thrown into that lake, it says that God will destroy their soul in the fire. And because we are mortal and need to be given immortality, then they don't have it. So this also then correlates to the free gift of eternal life. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we are given the gift of eternal life, which means we don't have eternal life. We're mortal. And so when we trust in Jesus, we're given eternal life. Those who don't trust in Jesus, whose name is not written in the book of life, they don't have eternal life. They're cast into the lake of fire, and I believe they will cease to exist. And that, to me, is more just anyhow, because those people want nothing to do with God. And God, I believe, in the end, with what we're looking at, will start to realise that in the end, God is going to give to people what they really want. And you think, that sounds a bit funny. Isn't God sort of, you know, in charge of everything? Yeah, but that's his grace. That's, that's how he is towards us. What do you want? People who don't want God, well, the eternal state, there's going to be God. God's going to be with us and there's going to be light. There's going to be a, an eternal new heaven, a new earth with God in, there. So anybody who doesn't want God, I think he's going to just simply grant them what they want and destroy them in the lake of fire. Now, the second set of books. Now, of course, none of that applies to us, hopefully, here. I'm assuming everybody here has their name written in the book of life. The second set of books, because remember, a good way to remember this is that idea, there's a second set of books running, you know, like the bad business. Second set of books, <laughs> two books. There's the Book of Life, one book, everybody's name in it. There's other books, plural, which is the Book of Works, which means there's a book for every one of you. And it, obviously it's a metaphor for God keeping track of what you say, what you do, the thoughts you have, the imaginations of your heart. He knows everything about you. And it's being sort of recorded, book of works. We are rewarded according to our works in those books. That's what we covered last week, and it's quite clear in Revelation. Having your name in the book of life frees you from the lake of fire. You now move on to the second stage, which is you become judged according to the works that are in your book of works. And this is where a lot of people then just don't know what to do with this because they sort of, yeah, but... I don't get judged. I just get lots of blessing because I believe in Jesus. But when you read it, this is how it reads. Now, we know that all have sinned and as such, all will die physically, spiritually and eternally. That's from Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, that's Adam, and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sin. All right? So all of us have the problem of sin. The debt of sin is paid. It is remitted by Jesus Christ. That when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, the debt of our sin is remitted. It's paid. Past, present and future. Hence, when your name is written in that book of life, it cannot be rubbed out of that book of life because you had your faith. Jesus gave to you eternal life. You will live forever because of your faith in Jesus Christ. Death then is swallowed up in victory for you. Now, some theologians, the reason I've put this in here is to help you understand how other people see this and why I believe this sets up a bit of a problem. Some theologians will explain it like this. Past, we have been saved from the penalty of sin. We have been justified. All right, so past sin. So you've got past, present and future. I'm saying past, present and future sin. The debt of all of it is cancelled because you've had faith in Jesus 
He paid the price of all of that sin. Your debt is remitted. You are given the free gift of eternal life. But I would say that's all. You note there that they see this um, remittance of sin as being the same as being forgiven. So theologians will argue that at the moment a person believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, their sins are forgiven. This is why I believe they don't know what to do with how the Bible words baptism. In several places it talks about it's a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins or a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So they say, well, hold on, it, it can't, forgiveness of sins can't be connected to baptism because they believe you've been forgiven of your sins when you believed in Jesus Christ. So what do we do with this? Instead of taking the word at face value for what it says, they turn around and say that baptism is an outward expression of an inner conversion. There is nowhere in the Bible that idea is explained that way. They do that because they've included forgiveness and remittance together and say, when you believe in Jesus, your sins are forgiven. So then when they read, you need to go through a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, they, they don't know what to do with that because in their mind they go, you're already forgiven. So why would we have to go through baptism? Baptism then just becomes a ritual. And that thinking takes all the power out of baptism and makes it nothing more than a religious ritual. And if it's a re religious ritual, I can do it or not do it, and it doesn't matter. But I'm suggesting to you that the one who has been offended or sinned against, who is God, he has said, if you want reconciliation with me, if you want forgiveness, this is the path. This is the narrow path. And the narrow path is believe on me for eternal life, repent of your sins, be baptised in a baptism of repentance, which means when you come up out of that water, you will no longer live for yourself, but you will live for Jesus Christ. You will be filled with the Holy Spirit. You'll be consecrated. And so that path leads to reconciliation. If somebody says, I just believe in Jesus and I have everything, then they're not following the narrow path. They're following the wide path. This is not in your notes, but it's coming to me. I've, I'm happy to say now, I think, because when I've looked back and read over Narrow is the path that leads to eternal life and few who find it. Wide is the path that leads to damnation or destruction. And it says many go in by it. So there's a wide path where many go in by the wide path. And we've talked before, haven't we? The expression go in, is that going into the lake of fire or is that going into the kingdom or into outer darkness? See, this is where why this understanding changes things and we need to go back and read, reread a lot of scriptures with this bigger understanding. So theologians would say, when you believed in Jesus, your sins were forgiven. So present, what they would say is we are being saved from the power of sin. We are being sanctified. So sins are forgiven. This is the traditional understanding. Sins are forgiven. I'm progressing the present. I'm learning in the power of the spirit to overcome. So the sin no longer has dominion over me. I have dominion over sin because I'm in the power of the spirit. So therefore I'm being sanctified or being saved. Future tense for them would be, we will be saved from the presence of sin. It will be completely gone. We will be glorified. So that means when we die, we leave all the sin behind. That's where Paul says it's a body of sin, a body of death. This body dies. It stays behind. I go into glory. And in that glorified state, there is no sin. Now, if that's the only way you think about salvation, I have a problem with that because it sets up a problem in your thinking. The problem I have with this approach is that it sees the issue as sin all the way through. So, so it sets up in a person's mind, my only problem with God is the sin that I commit. And it doesn't, it doesn't help a person realise, no, actually you've got another problem, which is your heart, your desire. What do you really want? You see, because there's a forgiveness of sins or a remittance of sins or coming into a place where sin doesn't have power over me, but what's actually my heart? What do I really want? And that's what I think this misses in the way this is taught because this can give the feeling that we don't need to worry too much about progressing. You know, I've said about progressing. Why don't we need to worry? Because we will be completely saved from the presence of sin and glorified, which sets up instinctively within a person that feeling that I don't need to really worry about anything because I'm going to be completely glorified. I'm going to be completely freed from the power of sin which instinctively then feels like I'm going to get everything. Whatever God has to offer, I'm going to get it because I believe in Jesus. 
So when you focus everything down to just being about sin, forgiven of sins, presently, the power of sin, you're being released from the power of sin through sanctification, and finally you'll be released from the presence of sin in a glorified state. And if that's the only way you're thinking about salvation, then the picture is in that glorified state, I get everything and I'm completely free. But what about your heart? So I'd say, yes, sin and death are dealt with by Jesus on the cross. But eternal life is about far more than simply living eternally without sin. I'll say it again. I believe eternal life is about far more than simply living eternally without sin. And I've highlighted there a comment which I think starts to summarise this. The degree to which our relationship is reconciled in this life is the degree to which we will experience him in eternity. Now, let me try and explain this a little bit. If you remember, I've said before that John 17 is a favourite section of scripture for me. And in particular, the part where he prays and says, I desire those that you have given me to be with me where I am to see the glory that I had with you before the foundation of the world. So in Jesus' mind, the greatest prize he can give any of us is to see him in the glory that he had before the foundation of the world. Now, when we talk about outer darkness, that outer darkness is not orientating to the light of the sun that goes around, how we go around the sun sets and rises, not that sun. But it's orientated to the glory of Christ himself. And so the greatest prize, the greatest benefit, the greatest reward for work is to be permanently in the glory of Christ, the Son of God. And he says that himself. He says, I desire. And when he prayed it in John 17, I desire those that you've given me to be with me where I am. If he's praying that, that means there's Christians who are not going to be with him where he is because he's praying. I desire them. Help them, Father to resist the evil, to follow the truth, to not be deceived and to be ready for his return so that he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant and we'll go in and we'll go in to be with him and we'll see him as he truly is and the fullness of his glory, which is the light. But then those who can't go in or don't go in are in darkness compared to the glory of Christ. And so the greatest prize, if we're thinking about rewards, the greatest prize is Christ himself. Now, a religious person probably won't think that way because they'll think more like, what am, I go- what am I going to get? You know, will I have more authority over more people? Will, will, you know, will I have power? Will I have authority? What, you know, what will I have? Most religious people would think like that. And that's why most teachers and preachers don't really go into expressing what, that, what the Bible teaches is the reward. But I believe the reward is Christ himself to see him as he truly is and to live permanently within his presence. Now that means then, is that annoying people or is that just annoying me? It keeps sort of cutting in and out. Is that, you're not hearing it? I'll do my best to ignore it, but it's really hard to concentrate when it's dropping in and out like that. The degree to which our relationship is reconciled in this life is the degree to which we'll experience him in eternity. This is what I believe Satan is working so hard to deceive Christians into thinking that simply because you believe in Jesus, you are going to get everything. That means they don't have to concentrate, consecrate themselves. They don't have to set themselves apart. They don't have to die to themselves. We believe, so therefore we're going to get it all. And, and I think the Lord is showing us that's why there's far fewer people who are ready for his return than what they realise. This is where I see a difference between people who believe in Jesus for eternal life and those who come after the Lord. Coming after the Lord requires more than faith alone. Coming after the Lord requires more than faith alone. Now, Peter's desire to save himself, we're going to use Peter as an example, to save himself was the springboard upon which Jesus used to teach about coming after him. So this is where Jesus said to his uh, apostles, you know, who do men say that I am? And this is where Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of God. And he says to him, you know, 
Blessed are you, Simon Barjana, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. In other words, he had a massive uh, sort of illumination of the truth that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. What a high moment for old Peter to be, you know, to have Jesus say that to him. And then we pick it up in Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. This is where he started to teach and explain to them, guys, I'm going down to Jerusalem. I'm going to be killed down there. And, of course, that that wasn't suiting Peter's plan. So in verse 22, then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, for, from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Okay, so all of a sudden Peter is at odds with Christ. Jesus has said, I'm going down there to die, and Peter has said, Far be it, Lord, I have a better plan for you. 23. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are an offence to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Now, it's that scenario that Jesus used to springboard into teaching about wanting to come after Christ. Quite often, we don't connect Matthew 16, 24 with what went before it. But I can imagine Peter would have just wanted that ground to open up and swallow him when Jesus kept going. Because he said in verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. So what had just happened? Peter was not prepared to deny himself. And this would have just cut Peter to the heart because Peter thought he had a better plan for Jesus. No, you're not going down there to die. I have a better plan for you. I have a better idea. And so Jesus just nailed it with Peter. Now, was Peter saved? when he realised that Jesus was the Christ and, and Jesus said to him, you know, blessed are you, Simon Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. So Peter had the revelation that Jesus was the Christ. So I would say at that point, you could clearly say that Peter was saved. He believed in Jesus for eternal life. But then he goes on and works against Jesus' own plan. And this is what Jesus said to him and to the others. If anyone desires to come after me, Let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Let me ask you a question. Do we need to deny ourselves in order to be saved? Well, you've got to ask the question, saved from what? In one sense, yes. In another sense, no. So this is why we've almost got to stop using the word saved as a noun to describe Christians because it's not used that way in Scripture. He was saved from the lake of fire, the moment he believed Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. But he's not saved in the sense of walking with Jesus until he's prepared to deny himself, take up his cross and follow him. And that's why I'm going to say that there's a difference between those who believe in Jesus and those who come after Jesus. So Peter believed in Jesus but hadn't learnt the lesson yet to come after him and that's what Jesus is saying. Peter, Wake up, Peter. If you want to come after me, you're going to have to deny yourself. You're going to have to get rid of that idea that you can come up with your own plan. Now, due to God's grace, Peter later in life was martyred. He was crucified. And when he was going to be crucified, he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like Christ. So church tradition has it that he was asked to be crucified upside down and they allowed that to happen. So Peter had an opportunity to deny himself. But when the opportunity was there with Christ, he didn't deny himself. And we know that he ran off and hid and he denied Christ three times. We know the story about Peter. So if we say then that a person has to deny themselves, take up their cross and follow Jesus in order to be saved from the lake of fire, then we have a gospel of salvation by works. If so, then salvation is not by grace, but conditional upon our ability to deny ourselves and obey the word. This quickly becomes work salvation and therefore Martin Luther died for nothing. So if you look at verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, what does that come after mean? If you want to come after me, like, so I want to come into eternal life. Well, it can't be that because then if it's coming into eternal life, 
then I have to deny myself, take up my cross in order to come into eternal life, which means then it's a gospel of works. We know it's a free gift of grace. So what is this coming after that, that is different than salvation? See, there's salvation, which is I believe in Jesus, therefore I'm given the free gift of eternal life. But then there, after that, there's this coming after Christ. following, And that's why there, there is going to be a difference to what Christians receive in eternal glory. We're not all going to get the same thing. I put it to you again that there is a difference between believing in Jesus, being saved by faith, and coming after Jesus. These are different things. So when we're reading scripture and we're reading about being saved, we've got to ask the question, are we being saved from walking in darkness? Because you can be a Christian and walk in darkness. That's what 1 John says. If you say that you have no sin, you're a liar and you walk in darkness. If you say you have fellowship with God and you walk in darkness, you're a liar. So Christians can walk in darkness. Christians can be fooled into thinking everything's okay when it's not. Meaning, if I, if I use the word Christian, to mean somebody who's believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. But Jesus is not talking here in Matthew 16, 24 of initial salvation. The free gift of eternal life. So, that, so if you hear me say initial salvation from now on, what I'm talking about is that free gift of eternal life by believing in Jesus. Initial salvation. Rather, he is talking about those who want to come after him, those who desire true fellowship with God and Jesus. Now, this is different, and that's why I don't like just seeing sin as the issue, you know, past sin forgiven, present sin, you're getting power over it in an eternal state, glorified, free. When it's all about sin, it's like, yeah, sin's taken care of, but what about your desire? What about what's in your heart? Do you desire to come after Christ? And I know if you're here, you probably do. I'm probably talking to the wrong crowd. But you know that there are many Christians who seem to not desire to want to come after Christ. So Jesus is talking about here of wanting to come after him. Those who desire true fellowship with God and Jesus Christ. In Matthew 16, because we're picking up, we've been looking at Matthew 16. I'm picking it up at verse 25. For whoever desires to come, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This is in Matthew 16. Yep, Matthew 16, 25, the next verse. So he talks about, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Then he goes on and says, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Now, let me ask you a question. When Peter said to Jesus, don't go down to Jerusalem, far be it for you to die, Lord. Really, Peter was trying to save his own bacon, most likely, and he wanted Jesus to live. So therefore, Peter was desiring to save his own life. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 25, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Does that mean that when Peter said, far be it, Lord, and he didn't want to lose his life, he wanted to save his life, did he lose salvation at that point? See, this is why we've got to start to think about this a little bit more. And where people have put it all into the one bucket, it's very confusing. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, this is where I've said before, there is a difference in the word life. There's life, like eternal life. The people who are in outer darkness, they have eternal life. They have life. That is going to be a very different life than eternally in the presence of Jesus where he said, I desire those you have given me to be with me, I am, to see the glory that I had with you, Father, before the foundation of the world. That life is going to be very different than that life. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, I don't believe that is talking about eternal life. I believe that is talking about the life with Christ in the new Jerusalem. Clearly from this verse and others like it, we can see that there is a life to be had which is beyond the initial gift of eternal life. Depending on your perspective about outer darkness, outer darkness can be considered a reward it, or it can be considered punishment. Think of it like this. If you're on your way to the lake of fire and you're going to be destroyed in the second death, 
and at the last minute on your sickbed, you believe that Jesus is the Christ, come into the world, and by God's grace, you're granted eternal life. But that eternal life, because you had no, you rejected Christ all your life and you had no opportunity to grow from there, you have eternal life, you'll be cast into outer darkness. Compared to hell, that's reward. You will have eternal life in the new earth. You ha shall have a glorified body. You shall not die. You shall be incorruptible. You'll not be overcome by sin again. You will live eternally in the new earth. That sounds like glory compared to hell. But it sounds like hell compared to living in the glory and presence of Jesus himself. And so then depending on the perspective, whether they call it out of darkness like punishment or out of darkness like reward. If you look at out of darkness from hell, it's a reward, eternal life. If you look at it from heaven and the new Jerusalem, then you'll look at it and say that's punishment because you didn't progress and weren't able to live in the presence of Christ. Hence, we come back to the statement that I made. The degree to which our relationship is reconciled in this life is the degree to which we'll experience him in eternity. Now, in context, that's he is talking to of Peter not being prepared to die with Jesus. So when we talk about deny yourself, take up your cross, make sure I get it right. If anyone desires to come after him, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Whoever drives eyes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. In context, that is talking about Peter not being prepared to die with Jesus. That's the direct context. Peter ended up dying for Christ to save his natural life. Sorry, he denied Christ to save his natural life. That's what he said when he went to the girl, the servant girl, and, he, and she said, weren't you with him? And he said, no. And then he said to the centurion, no, you know, I don't know the man. He denied Christ three times. He denied Jesus Christ to save his own life. Whoever denies me like that will lose his life. Now, clearly then, if we say that that losing life is losing salvation, we have a problem. No, he is saved because he believed Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. What he's losing is the life of fellowship with Jesus because he wasn't prepared to lay down his life to have fellowship with Jesus. He separated himself from Jesus, hid, denied him, and was not prepared to die with him. Thankfully, Peter was restored though. Now, because Peter did that, does this mean that Peter lost the free gift of eternal life because he denied Christ in order to save his own life? Remember what it says in verse 25, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Well, I say, no, he has not lost the free gift of eternal life. But what he did lose was fellowship with Jesus because he denied Christ. So there's a, there's a loss to be had. So if we go back and think of the two men who build on the same foundation. One of them builds with gold, silver, precious stone. One builds with wood, hay, straw, stubble. One receives a reward. The other, he loses it all, but he himself is saved. Why? Because he's built on the foundation. He's built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. He believes in Jesus. He has eternal life, but he has nothing. He'll most likely will be in outer darkness. And so he, therefore he can't lose that life because he sins. He can't lose that life because he fails but he can lose the life of fellowship with Christ, whereas the other one gains that. The reward, remember, is to be with Christ where he is. So this one is losing that sort of life with Christ, but he has eternal life. So therefore, our ongoing sin and our ongoing repentance of sin is affecting our relationship with Jesus on a relationship basis. Do we have relationship with God? So now Peter has a broken relationship with God because he denied Christ. And it needs to be restored. He did lose fellowship with God. He failed to deny himself and come after Christ. And as we know, Jesus made a way for Peter to be restored. But he didn't need to be saved again. So when Jesus came to Peter and said, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Three times he gave back to Peter the opportunity to sort of renounce the rejection of him, when he denied Christ three times and then Christ came to him after he was risen from the dead and said, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? 
So Jesus wasn't offering salvation again to Peter. Peter had salvation. He had eternal life. He knew Jesus was the Christ and the Messiah. But he wasn't prepared to give up his own life and walk with Christ. So then Jesus had to come to him and restore that relationship. Say, Peter, you denied me, but do you love me? Peter, you denied me back there, but do you love me? Peter, you denied me back there, but do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. As we know, Jesus made a way for Peter to be restored, but he didn't need to be saved again. With regard to initial salvation, eternal life, he has that. But he did need to be saved again with regard to a restored relationship with Jesus with Jesus, saved from unforgiveness and a broken relationship, saved from that so that true fellowship via the path of repentance can take place. Fellowship via repentance, forgiveness and reconciliation. These are all post-initial salvation. So initial salvation is I believe in Jesus the Christ, they have eternal life, but now you need to restore your relationship with God by walking the narrow path by denying yourself, by taking up your cross. So don't be fooled into thinking that when the day comes, like you can sit on your laurels here and ignore Christ and go fishing and sailing and do whatever you want, and then when the day comes and you stand before the Lord, you think you're going to have everything, and he'll say, who are you? I don't know who you are. Depart from me. You have eternal life, but you don't know me. So there's a difference between believing in Christ for eternal life and going after Christ. Those who desire to come after me need to deny themselves. So if you say to yourself, I want to come after you, Christ, then you're going to need to deny yourself and take up your cross. So when Jesus went to Peter and he said to Peter, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? Now that's easy for Peter to say, I love you. That's easy for you in the comfort of our Western Christian culture to say, I love you, Jesus. Going to be very different when you face the executioner. But Peter, praise God, had an opportunity to undo the the rejection and denial because he actually was martyred. And he didn't, he felt so, I think the church history goes that he felt so sort of disappointed in himself that the first time he wasn't prepared to be martyred with Jesus, that this time, yes, thank you, Lord, you've counted, I counted all joy that you've allowed me to share in your sufferings and die because of you, but I'm not worthy to be crucified like you were because I denied you back then crucify me upside down because I'm not worthy to be crucified. He did need to be saved again with regard to a restored relationship with Jesus, saved from unforgiveness and a broken relationship leading to true fellowship via repentance, forgiveness and reconciliation. These are all post or after initial salvation. Now, once again, this shows that forgiveness of sins is a discipleship issue. And the notes that I gave, the thing that I wrote that you are going to take home hopefully and read later will show in more detail the example, like multiple examples of how Christians are forgiven of their sins after salvation. Once again, here with Peter, we see that forgiveness of sin is a discipleship issue that forms the basis of true relationship, true reconciliation with God and Jesus Christ. Forgiveness of sins is therefore not a part of initial salvation, which is only faith in Christ for the free gift of eternal life, never to be lost. This is where the debate is getting confused. Can you lose your salvation? Well, you need to ask, what do you mean by salvation? If you mean eternal life, no, you can't lose it because it's eternal. It was given to us when we believed in Jesus Christ. There's nothing in Scripture that I can find that says that that can be rubbed out. But there are a lot of things that can be rubbed out because we deny Christ. We refuse to give up ourselves. We try to save our own life. There are consequences to the way we walk that are going to be carried into eternity. In 1 John 1, 7 to 10, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. But remember it says, if we walk in the light. If, verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So that is a clear correlation to the previous verse that if we say uh, we walk in the light and we have fellowship, but if we walk in sin, we deceive ourselves and that light or that truth is not in us. So in other words, 
1 John 1, he's teaching as Christians, you have sin and you have a sin issue that needs to be dealt with, not in terms of salvation, not in terms of eternal life. Now, that's dealt with. Your sins, the debt of your sin is paid. The only person who can pay that debt is Jesus on the cross. We're talking about relationship. We're talking about forgiveness. We're talking about reconciliation. So if you walk in darkness, you walk in a lie, you walk in an untruth and say you have fellowship with a righteous God, no, you're a liar. That's not true. If you want fellowship with God, you must walk in the light. You have to walk in the truth to have fellowship with God. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, and in 1 John this is clearly written to Christians, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So sin is an ongoing issue in the life of a believer because we have a body of sin, a body of death. We need to confess that sin. Now, this doesn't mean dragging up old sin from the past. If you're, if you're continually repenting or confessing the same sin over and over again, can I suggest you stop doing that? Because all that means is that you don't believe that Jesus has actually forgiven you. And the word says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So therefore, if you have confessed your sin, do not keep confessing it unless you keep committing it. So if you're committing a sin, the fresh sin needs to be confessed. Old sins, no, because if you keep confessing old sins, then you don't believe verse 9, which says he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. You're being deceived. You're being held in a sort of weird sort of state of Christianity where you feel like you're forgiven, but you're not forgiven and you've got to continually confess your sin before God. No, what, no matter how grave that sin is in your background, if you repented and confessed, it says he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So whatever that is back there, stop going back to dig it up. Right? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. This is talking about as you move forward and you sin. Don't just disregard it as not important. No, if you go forward and you sin in the future, that sin needs to be confessed. Why? Because it is interfering with your relationship with God. The same as when Peter denied Christ, he had to confess, no, I love you, Lord. No, I love you, Lord. No, I love you, Lord. Why? To, to make things right with God in terms of relationship, but not eternal life. Now, I've given three cases in Scripture that separate forgiveness of sins from initial salvation. Acts chapter 2, the people who crucified Jesus Christ, Peter being forgiven for denying Christ, and 1 John 1, confessing our sins as believers for forgiveness as believers who are saved. So I've given three cases so far, and there's probably more, but three is enough to show I believe that there is a role of forgiveness that's in the life of the believer, which means then if you need to be forgiven as a believer, that means then that some sins, future sins, are, and your behaviour is not forgiven by faith in Christ. Faith in Christ remits the debt of the sin. Forgiveness is upon repentance and reconciliation and denying yourself and taking up your cross and following. Why? Because it's a relationship issue. It's not a legal issue. It's not a debt issue. And as John said, if you say that you have fellowship with God and walk in darkness, you are a liar. Let's get back to Matthew 16. Do we need to deny ourselves in order to be saved? Verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Do we need to deny ourselves in order to be saved? If you mean initial salvation, the answer is no, it is by faith alone. But if you mean saved from a broken relationship, saved by being from the outer darkness, saved from not being intimate and walking in faith and fellowship, because then yes. Hence, saved is not a good word to describe Christianity. So really, when we're sharing the gospel we, with new converts, we probably should be talking more in the language of the free gift of eternal life rather than the word saved. Or if we do use saved, then say, Jesus will give you the free gift of eternal life if you believe in him. And that sheet that I gave you will explain what you need to believe in. You'll be, you'll be saved from the lake of fire and given the free gift of eternal life. 
But now you need to progress if you want to be saved from a broken relationship, if you want to be saved from being unreconciled, if you want to be saved from being cast into outer darkness, that's going to require you to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. Now, this is one of many verses that make it look like the gift of eternal life is by works. Let's read it carefully without reading into it. Peter desired, desired to save his own life. Remember the story of Peter, we've been through it hidden behind a false facade of wanting to save Jesus from death. Peter was not prepared to to die with Christ. And as we know with Peter, and in 1 John 1, the forgiveness of sin is after initial salvation and is about our ongoing relationship, ongoing salvation, being saved. We are saved and yet we are being saved. Our debt because of sin is dealt with, past, present and future. But this is different to forgiveness. Forgiveness involves godly sorrow, repentance that becomes the basis for true reconciliation that brings about abundant life. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Now we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7 because this again is talking to believers. This is a discipleship section of scripture. This is explaining how to live as a believer. So 2 Corinthians chapter 7, in context, this godly sorrow was a sorrow upon the Christian heart that led to salvation, a salvation after faith in Christ for eternal life. Now, the reason we know that is if you start 2 Corinthians verse 7, chapter 7, verse 7, not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you, when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. Non-Christians do not have zeal for Paul. Non-Christians hate Paul. Everywhere Paul went, non-Christians just wanted to kill him. So anyone who had zeal for Paul is a Christian. So these are Christians. This godly sorrow is coming upon Christian hearts. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, so in other words, he wrote a letter that made them sorry. In other words, he gave them a bit of a disciple, you know, an apostle crack, got the whip out. Come on, guys. So it made them sorry. Even if I made you sorry with my letter. So he doesn't write letters to non-believers. He writes letters to the church. This is the church. This is believers. For if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I perceived that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. So he didn't regret making them sorry, but he did regret the fact that it wasn't a hard enough letter because they quickly dismissed the sorrow and didn't repent. He says, I perceive for the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. He doesn't want sorrow for a while. He wants godly sorrow that turns into repentance. This is for believers. Verse 9, now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. This is believers. He, he sent a letter to them, rebuking them in some way, that they were, cut, they were sorry, but only for a while. But he rejoiced that their sorrow did eventually lead to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. So for Christians... There's sorrow in a godly manner that leads to repentance as a believer. So this hyper grace that says, don't worry about sin, just say, thank you, Lord, for forgiving me of my sins. That's not what Paul is saying here. He wants to write to them and make them feel godly sorrow, regretting what they have done, which will lead to true repentance, which will last. Verse 10, for godly sorrow produces repentance, and remember, repentance is more than, I'm sorry, Lord, it's a turning away from that sin. So whatever he said to them produced sorrow, but it also produced repentance. We get it, Paul, we're doing the wrong thing, we've done the wrong thing, we're sorry, but we're going to turn away from it. We're going to repent. We're going to abandon this sin. So that godly sorrow in a believer that produces repentance in a believer leads to salvation. Read verse 10. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Hold on, we're already saved. 
So what salvation is Paul talking about? For godly sorrow produces repentance to salvation. Now he's not saying that these Christians were unsaved. These Christians have eternal life. They believe Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. They have eternal life. So what salvation are they gaining? They're gaining the salvation of a restored relationship with God because they're turning away from the things that God hates and turning to the things that God loves. They are sorry that they are wicked. They're repentant of their sin and they're turning to Christ. Now that sounds like salvation by works and it is a form of salvation by works, but it's saving the relationship. This is what John says. If you say that you have fellowship with God and walk in darkness, you are a liar. And Paul is saying the same thing. If you want fellowship with God, then you have to let that godly sorrow produce repentance, which is a turning away from that sin and walking in the light and walking in the truth. So that when he comes, he will recognize you. When he comes, you'll say, that person is like me. We don't want him to come and look at us and go, I do not know you. Get away from me, you who practice what? Lawlessness. See, so even in that qualification where people come and say, Lord, Lord, let us in, and he says, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, that then makes it look like are we saved by being righteous, self-righteous? No, what, it, what it's saying is you don't have fellowship with God if you walk in sin. You don't have fellowship with God if you walk in darkness. The debt of sin is paid by Jesus, you will have eternal life. But the question is where are you going to spend eternal life? Now, if you say you want fellowship with God and you walk in darkness, you're a liar. What that means is you, you're lying to yourself. You are lying to yourself if you think you want fellowship with God and yet you walk in darkness. If you walk in unrepentant sin, if you walk in deceptive teaching, if you walk deliberately in a way that you know is not Christ-like and you say you want fellowship with God, you lie. Now, when Jesus came to Peter, and he said to Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Trying to give Peter a chance to reconcile his denial. That wasn't tested then. That was just Peter having the opportunity to say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. When was it tested? When he had to die, when he was martyred. He found out later whether he actually loved the Lord or not. He found out later whether those words were true. See, words are easy to say, Lord, I love you. Lord, I follow you. The practice is hard. And you prove your love by obedience. You prove your love by denying yourself, taking up your cross and following him. That's why I say coming after Christ is different than believing in Christ. There are many, many people who believe in Christ but do not want to come after him. If you ask them, they'll probably say, yes, I want to come after the Lord. Yes, I believe the Lord. But then you look deeper into their life and Jesus knows their life. If they are practicing lawlessness, if they are wicked, they've got secret sin, unrepentant sin, they're deceptive in their teaching, they're not denying themselves, they're not taking up their cross, they're not following Jesus, then they are lying to themselves. So please, here, make sure you are not lying to yourself, saying that you're a good Christian, following Jesus, but you're unrepentant. You're not sorry when you sin. If you are not sorry when you sin, then you are lying to yourself if you think, that you say you want fellowship with God. Your sin has to cause godly sorrow that leads to repentance as a believer. Now, Paul is talking to Christian, Christians who after initial salvation had to come under godly sorrow and true repentance in order to be saved leading to salvation. Now, that's not saved from the lake of fire. That's saved from out of darkness. That's saved from being unknown by God because they are in such contradiction to the nature of God. So ask yourself the question, is your life in contradiction to the nature of God? Are you saying you're a Christian? Are you saying you're living a godly life when you're not? Well, if your life in practice is not uh, in harmony with God's life, then when he comes, remember, your work will be judged. And if all your work is burned and you suffer the loss of it all, you yourself will be saved, but what's going to happen to you? You're not going in. You're going to be cast into outer darkness. You will not be in the wedding feast. You will not be in the great supper. You will not be in the new Jerusalem. Why? Because you already chose. You chose yourself as an idol above God. You said, I want to do my thing, and I'll, I'll say to the Lord, I love you. I'll say to the Lord, I believe in you. This is why James said, I will show you my faith by my works. 
I will show you I love Jesus by what I do. So when, if I was to follow you around, what are you doing in secret? Jesus sees what you do in secret. And if you say to me you love the Lord and want to follow the Lord and yet you have secret sin, you're a liar and you know it. So you need to get real. This is what's happening. Jesus is saying, I'm coming and you're running out of time. You've got to get that sin out of your life. You've got to repent of your sin and live a holy, consecrated life. So when I come, you'll hear me say, well done, good and faithful servant. When he comes, he'll recognize you. So you can fool all of us. You can fool us. You can come and be nice. You can say the right things. You can appear the right way. But Jesus knows your heart. He knows deep down whether you really want him or not. And if you really want him, then pluck out your eye, cut off your hand, do whatever is necessary to stop yourself from sinning. Why? Because godly sorrow, true godly sorrow, will lead to true repentance, which will lead to a righteous life. And where do we get the power for that? Not out of self-righteousness, that's religion. Where does the power come from? He sees your heart. And if he sees your heart and says, Lord, I want you, then he will give you the power of the Holy Spirit. He'll give you his righteousness to overcome whatever it is you're struggling to overcome. You've got to get real with yourself. Are you lying to yourself, pretending that you want to follow Christ, or are you actually following Christ? Luke chapter, Luke chapter 6. Actually, well, no, I'll just read a few of these. John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Luke 6, 46 to 49. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and we want to come to Jesus and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it for it was founded on the rock, there are hard times coming on the earth, tribulation times. Have you built upon the rock? And have you built in such a way that your house, your faith and your life with Christ will stand in the day of tribulation? Verse 49, but he who heard and did nothing, that's the wicked, lazy servant, isn't it? He had a talent. He did nothing. He buried it. He's like a man who built his house on the earth without a foundation and against which the storm beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. That house is people. That house is people who are saying they're building on Jesus Christ when they're not and the house can fall. But if you have faith in Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, you have eternal life, but then you build and everything you build falls because it's not right. There are Christians who do not build on the rock. They fail to obey even though they say they love the Lord. They say they want fellowship, but they lie. There's one John 1 says, they lie and the truth is not in them. This does not mean that through disobedience you lose salvation, if we mean by salvation eternal life. But you do lose fellowship with God and fellowship with Jesus Christ. The ruin of that life or that house was great. Because of the two-bucket problem, many Christians are incapable of comprehending the eternal consequences of disobedience. There is an eternal consequence of disobedience. But if you here have been disobedient and you have secret sin, it's not too late. Christ hasn't returned yet. You're still alive. You have time. Let the godly sorrow strike your heart. Get alone with the Lord and weep on the ground and be determined to let that thing go. Get rid of it. Get rid of the idols. Get rid of the self-idolatry and pursue Christ ready for his return. Back to Matthew 16. Do we do need to deny ourselves in order to be saved? Matthew 16, 21 and 27. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man gain, give in exchange for his soul? Remember in Luke 9, 25. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and himself is destroyed or lost? As, as I showed you a couple of weeks ago, that verse is best understood like this. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed in the lake of fire? 
or cast into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What do you really gain by being self-centered? What do you really gain when you're not prepared to deny yourself? Now, I know that I say deny yourself, and I, I often think people don't quite get this. When you're in a situation and somebody says something that's offensive to you and you want to get upset, if you get upset, you're not denying yourself. What you're doing is you're gratifying yourself. If you get angry at other people because they do something stupid or not nice to you and you get angry at them, you're not denying yourself. You're gratifying yourself. When you gratify self, you'll get upset, you'll get offended, you'll get angry. You'll be quite horrible as a person, actually, because you'll be so self-centered. Deny yourself. And then, you, then that, that's part of why I think forgiveness of others. Because when you deny yourself, everybody is forgiven. Why? Because the only reason I don't forgive other people is I'm not prepared to deny myself. I feel justified in keeping something against you. Let it go. Deny self. And, and so this is, this is what Jesus said. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. This was, sorry, what Paul said about Jesus. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men and was obedient, even unto death. So the word says, be like that. Have no reputation. Deny yourself. And be obedient to Christ even unto death. That's what Jesus was to the Father. And the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 to have that same mind. Remember, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his holy angels and then... He will reward each according to his works. I do not believe we'll be all glorified by simply believing that Jesus can free us from death and give us life. If glorified simply means the body of sin and death is done away with, then yes, they will only be glorified in the sense that they no longer have a body of death or sin. But there is a glory, a life, beyond the initial gift of eternal life, if we have a dichotomy between heaven and hell in our thinking, the saved and the unsaved, then every verse that pertains to punishment or wrath will be placed upon the unsaved in our thinking, the people in hell. But now we know that there's a place for punishment of the saved, but unrepentant. The saved Christian who is unrepentant, there's a place for you. It's called out of darkness. And there there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? Because you'll not be going in. We've looked at those verses over the last few years. The foolish virgins, the lazy, wicked servant, the ones who didn't use their talent. There are many parables that talk about people who believe in Jesus who are not going in. Compared to hell, it'll be glory. Compared to heaven, it'll be out of darkness. Now, let me just ask you a closure with this thought. What would have happened if Peter, if out of fear and embarrassment when Jesus said, do you love me? or his continued desire for self-survival, thinking when Jesus came to him and said, do you love me, Peter? And then if Peter sort of went, man, I know that if I say that I love you, this is going to end up in me being killed. What if out of fear he said no, Jesus, when he offered reconciliation, when he said, no, I don't love you? Well, if Peter had faced himself and said, look, the reality is, Jesus, I'm not prepared to die. So the reality is, if I'm not prepared to die, I don't really love you. No, Jesus, I don't love you. Imagine what would have happened to Peter if he'd said that. Now, some people say, yes, I love you, but they don't follow through with the action. Peter said, yes, Lord, I love you, and he followed through with the action. He had an opportunity to demonstrate the truth of that statement. So if you say that you love the Lord, I pray that God, by his grace, will give you an opportunity to demonstrate your love for him, which may even in, for this generation include beheading because of the last days. So get ready. Jesus says, be ready. How, Lord? How? What do you mean be ready? Be ready by realizing that you have to. If you want to come after me, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for your word to us. A bit of a hard word. Not many Christians would like that. Uh, but I pray, Lord, that by your grace, you'll give us the spirit and the heart to pursue you. Lord, we will, by your grace, Lord, let your grace work in our life to have the capacity to deny ourselves, to stop getting angry and arguing and being unforgiving to people out of some sort of self-righteousness. 
Lord, help us to give self up, to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow you so that we can come into the eternal glory to see you as you truly are. Oh, boy, we look forward to that day, Lord. Come, come quickly, Jesus, I pray. Amen.